Oh, I'm standing here and I am uh, confronted with a roll of duct tape. And, and it kind of inspired me a bit because I've instructed all of my children to make sure that no matter where they are, what vehicle they're in, they have a pen knife, screwdriver, duct tape. Trust me, it can fix anything and get your car anywhere. So obviously, if something goes wrong here today, we've got duct tape. We're good. <laughs> Thank you all very much for uh, joining us here today. And before we progress any further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the land on which we find ourselves today, um, their elders, past, present and future, and acknowledge the wealth of history and story that they bring to us here today. So thank you. A few pieces of housekeeping. If you have everyone who has their mobile phone, please turn it to silent. Do it now. Because yeah. there's nothing worse than hearing my particular ringtone, which depending on who's calling me, could be a rooster or this lovely piece of bark music, which could be nice, but let's not. In the case of the alarms going off for whatever emergency it may be, Please remain in this room in your seats until you are directed by State Library staff to move from the building. The place where we all congregate should such an event occur is down the steps and across the road in the domain. But again, make sure that you follow st uh, State Library staff directions. Um, don't everybody jump up and run out the door. Just don't do it. Okay, I think that's it in terms of those one of details. To kick off, I would like to introduce the New South Wales State Librarian, Dr. John Bellance, and a few words of welcome from him. Thanks. Thanks so much, Catherine. The warmest of welcomes to the State Library. And for those of you who can see my image in that little box on the lower right part of the screen, very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us streaming across New South Wales. Uh, I'm really pleased that you're all here. It's a really important occasion. Uh, I've been asked just to spend a few minutes in very general terms putting some of the issues you'll be discussing into a wider context. Uh, we all know about libraries and their fundamental obligation for uh, the collection, the preservation and accessing of uh, material about who we are, where we are in the world. Uh, and there's some amazing opportunities in this particular field at the moment. One of the most important fields that is developing here in the library is in the rediscovery of the living traditions of the uh, indigenous custodians of these lands. It's one of the most exciting programs that we're involved with at the moment. Um, there's a project called Awakening Language, trying to rediscover living Aboriginal languages across New South Wales. There's, uh, I, I don't know whether you're like me, or you feel a bit iffy about our national anthem. Uh, I think the words of our national anthem are pretty awful. Uh, but there's one line that really sticks in my craw, and that is for we are young and free, uh, because we're in fact part of one of the most ancient civilizations on earth. It's an extraordinary thing even to contemplate. And so I too acknowledge the uh, traditional ancient Australian custodians, the Gadigal people of the land that we're gathering on today. Uh, that's not just a preliminary, that's organically part of our deliberation, part of our discussions. Uh, about 30 years ago when I was working in a completely different context, uh, we were told that libraries weren't going to survive. The internet was just being invented. The World Wide Web is just being invented. Uh, and even then, in the early 1990s, people were saying that like, Google was just a twinkle in someone's eye in the back of the garage. But they were even then saying, look, people will just Google it. And uh, that would be the end of libraries. And that couldn't have been more wrong. In fact, it's quite interesting to look at just how wrong the futurists, the pundits, have been at almost every step along this information highway that they used to call it. Uh, they're just wrong, wrong, wrong. And now, uh, just before we started today, uh, my colleague Lisa O'Sullivan, who's the new director of PLE at the library and someone you must meet before you go today, uh, and Catherine and I were talking about this work 
being done on um, what's known as algorithms of oppression, the way in which Google decides what it is that you should be allowed to know about. Uh, it's not just Google. Uh, I had an interesting experience a few weeks ago. I bought some cartridges for my inkjet printer online. Uh, and my world is actually closed in around my experience of buying cartridges for my inkjet printer online. Every time I look at anything on my screen, I've got little cartridges for inkjet printers popping up in the corner. Uh, it's as though that's the only thing I'm interested in in the world. And some machine somewhere has thought that John Balance leads a rather limited and sheltered life, but we know he loves cartridges for inkjet printers. So we're going we're to hit him where it hurts. Um, it's a really terrifying thought. Um, Amazon does that. Some people tend to like it. But this is where your professionalism is more important, arguably, than it's ever been before. When people come and they want to find out about things, uh, they need to understand that Google is actually, in many cases, not going to give them a transparent answer. They need to be able to speak to people. They need to be able to speak to people with a professional, critical background who know what they're doing, who know what the pitfalls were. Um, I remember when I very first got my uh, driver's license when I went over to work in England and I noticed that on all the things that I was licensed to drive, there was something called a track lane vehicle steered by its own tracks. Uh, and relying purely on technology is very much like relying on a track lane vehicle steered by its own tracks. It decides where you're going to go and it takes you there. Uh, and along the way, loads of things that you might have discovered if you had had proper professional human support are closed off to you. Uh, and I hope that that's one of the things that you're going to be discussing today. Um, Thoreau, back in the 19th century, talking about the history of technology in education, noted even then that it was a story of people finding improved means to unimproved ends. We always have to know why we're doing something, what it's for, not just how glitzy and, fasc and fascinating and, and effective it is. Um, which goes to something that's really important and is really quite striking, and that is the renaissance of public libraries across the state. Uh, again, 30 years ago, people were saying they're going to die out, and they were completely wrong. I've been state librarian now for eight months, and in that time I've been to Coffs Harbour. I noticed that Catherine was down in Goulburn that day, just to avoid the visit. But, uh, I've been to Coffs Harbour, I've been to Tweed, I've been to Bathurst, I've been to Wollongong, uh, I've been to various Sydney libraries, I'm going to Shell Harbour next week, I was in Maitland last week, uh, and everywhere I go, I see libraries developing new characteristics that fit their own communities. And if anything, they're more important than they were 50 years ago. People, as you may have heard me say before, people tend not perhaps to go to church in the way they used to, and a lot of the traditional figures in communities like the bank manager and the solicitor and the accountant aren't really there anymore. Many of them are digital themselves. The library is the one place where anyone is welcome, anyone at all, regardless of background, where anyone can be expected to be treated with respect and where everyone is safe. And that is a really big thing to say. That's a really significant thing to say. Um, I don't want to overstay my welcome, but um, when I started at the library, I uh, wrote a little diary uh, note for myself about a day in the life of this place. And it isn't just about people coming in and using free Wi-Fi and sitting downstairs Googling documents and filling out forms. Uh, it is a really fascinating place. The day starts with a group of homeless men who wait outside. They come in and they have breakfast and they spend much of the day in the library. Uh, it's a critically important part of their life and I've got to know quite a few of them very well. Um, then there are all sorts of people from all walks of life. I'll never forget the day I saw a director of Telstra having breakfast with one of the homeless men in the cafe just outside. And what they had in common was a love of the library. Uh, you know, it was really quite quite extraordinary, and you don't see that sort of thing uh, in many other places. Uh, the I won't read out what I uh, what I'd written here, but during this particular day, a former premier came to discuss the deposit of papers. We had meetings to work out which rare books we should buy. We decided to buy a first edition of, of uh, Jane Austen. Uh, there's a digitization lab that was working on improving access on our website, which is one of the big problems we have at the moment, the catalogue. Uh, I was sn sniffing at Google a moment ago. 
But the fact is, it's arguable that library catalog technology has actually grown in its own little silo, and it does need to learn quite a lot. A lot of readers do now expect the kind of functionality that Google can provide, and library catalogs uh, arguably are uh, much the same as they were 20 years ago. They're just presented in a slightly different way, and that's a really big challenge. Um, but going on, um, I met a group of, uh, of little boys and girls from a primary school in Dubbo who had written a uh, written essays, and uh, the winners had been invited down to Sydney to receive prizes. And there was one little girl who his winning essay, I think she'd gotten the first prize in the state, had uh, written a story about how she killed her parents by letting the air out of a blimp in which they were travelling, and now reflecting on what she'd done at the age of 60. She was wondering if she'd really done the right thing after all. And her parents were standing next to her, and they were so proud of her. Um, now, that's the sort of thing that you don't get if you're just living in a purely digital world. Um, the police came twice that day, because it turns out that our lockers were being used to deposit drugs. Uh, they're the cheapest <laughs> lockers in Sydney, uh, and they turn out to be a place where you leave stolen goods. You know, you don't, all of this, I, you know, I could go on, and but I've run out of time now. Um, libraries are really fascinating places. I don't need to tell you that. Uh, and the, a lot of the things on your agenda today go right to the heart of their relevance, their usability, their functionality uh, for the people who rely on them so heavily. So I'm really delighted that you're here. As I said, I hope you have a really productive seminar. And uh, thank you for having it here. Now we have um, our first speakers for the day, Kate LeMay and Tom Honeyman from the Australian National Data Service. And the topic of their presentation is digging into data visualisation. Good? Am I good? It's there. I will actually disappear from your screen so that you can keep going. And at the end, after Tom's done his bit as well, I'll come back for any questions. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yes. And can you see my screen, the presentation? We good? Yes. Okay. Yes. Fabulous. Thank you very much for um, having us here today. Um, so. I am calling in from Chile, Canberra, and I apologise for not being able to be there today, um, but Tom um, will be running an activity with you after I have a little chat with you about data visualisation. Uh, and I just wanted to let you know that the slides for um, this presentation are on the ANDS website, which is um, ANDS, A-N-D-S, dot org, dot A-U, um, and they're under our presentations tab, so they're already up there if anyone wants to go there. There's quite a few uh, links in here to some resources and things uh, for you to be able to use. Uh, and I just also wanted to flag that I'm going to be talking about um, uh, both some general principles, and they can be used both for interpreting and creating visualisations. So just keep that in mind when we're um, going through these principles. So uh, initially, I'm going to ask the question, what is a visualisation? So um, a nice uh, explanation can be that a visual explanation. So anything that helps us understand something by looking at it. So here's a really great visualisation the map of the London Underground. Um, it's really good because it shows the relationship between the different objects, which in this case is how to get from one point to another. And very interestingly, the designer of this visualisation realised that when you're underground, it doesn't matter um, the exact direction of the next station. What matters is the relationship between the two stations um, that you're going um, from and to. So London isn't actually laid out in a perfect grid like this because it's a very old city that's been built many times. Um, and uh, so this isn't a true um, accurate depiction of the city, but it's a good visualisation because it gives you this visual explanation of how to get from point A to point B. Here's another visualisation that many people would be familiar with, how to put together a bookcase um, that may or may not cause a panic attack when people look at it. Uh, and 
Now let's think about why do we want to have visualizations. So um, this is Anscombe's quartet and it's a famous famous example of um, uh, a visualization and how um, it's important to have them. So there's some random numbers here. We look at it and we think, oh yes, that's a table of numbers. It's not, not very meaningful to us. So here are some summary statistics of that table of numbers. So if I just go back, you can see that there's four, one, two, three, four um, columns. And when we uh, look at these summary statistics, um, the summary statistics are, are similar, uh, the same for these four columns. So they've got the same mean, which is the average um, and um, the other statistics there. So uh, we'd be tempted uh, to say that they're all the same if we're looking at these summary statistics. However, when we look at them graphed, we can see that actually they're quite different. So that's a really great example of seeing um, how visualizations can give us some uh, extra information. Now I'm not going to go through uh, all of these in detail, but Edward Tuft was a um, pioneer in this area and he wrote this book, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. And these are some of the principles um, that are from his book about um, visualizations and uh, things that uh, are helpful when we're creating them. Uh, one of these that I'm going to show you now is present many numbers in a small space. So this is an example from the Bureau of Meteorology and it's Australian rainfall deciles. And you can see the scale on the right hand side um, says uh, highest on record at the top and lowest on record at the bottom. So what this is um, looking at is rainfall in December 2017, but it's looking at also data historically because it's saying is it the highest, the lowest or average compared to the record. So the many numbers that are being presented in this small space is that it's um, divided the map of Australia into a grid, which is 640 by 480 cells in the whole map. And it's covering 117 years of data per cell. So that's nearly 36 million points of data presented in one visualization. So it, you can see here how many numbers are able to be presented in a small space. A really important thing about visualizations is that they can tell a story quite quickly. So uh, if you just glanced at this, um, naturally we presume that red is hot and blue is cold. We can see here that it's telling us something about Australia being hot. And um, we can see down the bottom that it's trend in maximum temperature. And so that tells us a story fairly quickly about um, this picture. This is another visualization that tells a story and it's a video um, and I've linked it down the bottom. Uh, it's a really nice video to watch. And what it's talking about is charting culture. And you can see all these little um, red and blue lines and they're kind of, um, what they're showing is uh, famous people in history and it shows where they were born and where they died. And uh, it shows the movement of culture um, throughout the world. So you can see here, there's quite a gathering around England and then there's movement through Europe. Um, it's very interesting when it gets to the point of America, it starts on one coast and then starts moving across as people moved across America. So um, visualizations don't have to be a static picture, they can also um, be told in a video. Uh, so this is another story that's being told in a visualization. And you can see as soon as you look at it, American football injuries, there's lots of points that are highlighted on this person's body. It's talking about injuries that were in a, um, sustained in a season of American football. And the story that you get told is, it's a bit of a dangerous sport. Here's another, a screenshot from another video, um, which again is linked at the bottom. It's a four minute video. Um, and what it is talking about, it's got this 
gentleman here in the back, Hans Rosling, and it's got this graph in the front, and he um, narrates the graph like a sports commentator. It's quite interesting. And on one side here, we've got um, the lifespan of people in countries, and on the bottom along here, we've got the income, and you can see as it moves through time, which is shown here, it um, starts down in the corner and then things gradually move up. Uh, so that's another interesting visualisation to watch and it tells a really good story. So uh, let's think about what sort of stories can librarians tell with visualisations. So you can think about what services um, you provide. You might uh, need to provide a report either to whoever uh, funds your library or um, internally uh, in your library about decision making. Uh, for example, the types of resources that are being um, borrowed or um, where you've got a lot of demand for resources within your library um, to be able to decide how to allocate um, funds in the future. Uh, also advertising to customers, things like infographics, um, uh, a type of visualisation um, that are very useful to, um, report, to report or to provide information about services that you provide to the public. There's also um, data that your council owns that um, can be uh, visualised and there's a really um, interesting uh, website here, Understanding Your Council from the Audit Office of New South Wales and uh, I'm just going to quickly flick over to that. And you can see here um, there's a map and you can click on the map uh, or you can go down and search on the list. If you click on the council, it gives you um, information that Audit New South Wales has about those councils. And um, it gives you an impression that it's a sort of living um, visualisation because the um, things come across as, as you scroll down. And you can also compare councils on that one. So that's just a nice simple example of a um, visualisation with council data. Uh, there's also um, a, a, an example from the UK, the Open Data Institute uh, is uh, doing an exercise with four councils about using open data to redesign services for um, the councils and uh, that's an interesting example to have a look at as well. Um, the New South Wales Government has a lot of data available on um, data.nsw.gov.au and uh, you can have a look in there and um, see if there's any information that um, either someone uh, is coming to you to ask for some information and some of that, inf that data could um, help to answer their question or it could be something that could inform um, some sort of services that you provide or um, getting some information about your local community and how you can provide better services to them. So uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of techniques that are helpful uh, both when interpreting and creating visualisations. So uh, this, this slide says natural mappings and what that means is to use something that appears that comes naturally to us. So for example, this is a um, windrose and it's from Melbourne Airport and we can see up here this is a um, compass and north is pointing up and that is the natural mapping for us. Um, when we see a compass we, pre we presume that north will be pointing up. It would be odd for us if this line that is showing us that most of the winds in the Melbourne airport are northerly, if it was pointing down say to the bottom right or something like that. So highlighting relevant information is a really um, important technique. So we can, what this is, is um, talking about the Cape Town water supplies. So you can see that the data from earlier years, 2013 to 2017, is greyed out. And then the 2017 to 18 data is the one that's highlighted because that was the important information. So it's telling this story, like we were talking about before, that it was that the water supplies are gradually decreasing um, and then we're 
this is our year that we're in now and we're looking at um, this line which is highlighted and there were some projections about potentially running out of water in Cape Town. So it's also important that comparisons are clear. So you can see that these maps are overlaid on each other and the important thing is that the white is sea ice and you can easily see going from left to right that there's getting less sea ice as you're going through time. So that's a really clear comparison of those dates and the amount of sea ice. It's also important to make the scale clear. So I've highlighted um, this scale with a um, purple uh, box and it, the scale says 100 million light years. This is a map of space. And so we can see that's 100 million light years. It's a really big map. Um, so it's important that the scale is really clear on visualizations. So this uh, visualization we saw a little bit earlier, color should be adding meaning to a visualization. So uh, as I said uh, earlier, red says to us hot, blue says to us cool. So we can look at it straight away and say, oh, it looks like things are getting hotter. If this was say purple and green, that wouldn't be adding meaning for us. And here's an example of when colour doesn't add meaning. So uh, this is talking about average credit card debt by age. Up this side is the credit card debt. Down here is age. The bars are coloured, but there is no meaning being added by the bars. This red bar is not related to that red bar. They just happen to have been coloured that way by, they probably did it in Excel. Um, it's you know some color scheme in Excel and they thought it looked nice. Um, but if color doesn't add any meaning, you shouldn't use color. And uh, we should be using conventions. So just like I mentioned with the natural mapping of the windrows where north is pointing up, um, again, we should be um, using conventions. So when we look at this, this says temperature, we go, oh yes, it looks like temperature is decreasing, but actually the time on the bottom here is going from earlier to later, right to left. So actually the temperature is increasing, but this is not a conventional um, way of uh, depicting something. So that's confusing um, to the person who's looking at it. Uh, it's not as we would naturally expect it to be. So that's uh, just um, the end of the techniques that um, you might be able to use. And I just wanted to um, point due to some tools that can be used for data visualization. So Excel, most people are familiar with that you can um, make charts in there. There's also um, some other uh, software that you can use uh, like Google Fusion Tables, um, Tableau. Uh, this is a link to um, a blog about some other visualization tools. This is a link as well for some um, really um, simple tips on making charts and graphs look good. Uh, but if you just Google data visualization, there are really so many resources on tips of how to do it and um, examples and ways that you can do it within those um, pieces of software that I mentioned. So there's a lot of resources out there on how to create data visualizations. Uh, and these are some references that I thought might be helpful specifically for um, this group of people. Um, so I was very excited when I came across um, this book, Data Visualization, A Guide to Visual Storytelling for Libraries. Um, and I found a review about it um, that, and part of it, it said, as libraries become more dependent on data to monitor usage and justify services, this book fills a gap in the literature by addressing data visualization in a library context. So I thought that's a bit of a perfect summary of um, the things that we've been talking about. So if um, you're interested in this topic, I would say that would be a good book to have a look at. Um, there are some other links here in this slide to some other resources as well. And as I mentioned, the slides are all up on the um, ANS website and you can get them and go and have a look at um, those resources. And the last thing I'll uh, mention is uh, that we have, uh, there are some other places uh, where you can uh, look 
to get some more um, data skills as well. We have our program called 23 Research Data Things, which was um, originally designed for librarians to be able to learn about research data. Um, and uh, it's on the ANS website and you can work through it um, in your uh, own time, at, at your own pace. Uh, or it's also got resources about how you can turn that program into um, a workshop um, and you know do it together. Uh, it's it talks you through lots and lots of different um, topics around data, uh, and it was very well received when we first ran it. And um, people are still getting a lot of um, value out of that uh, resource. And everything on the ANS website is uh, free and um, always um, available for reuse with Creative Commons licenses. There's also um, a report about data savvy librarians um, that uh, talks about how um, librarians can become more data savvy and um, ways in which that can be um, implemented within um, organisations. And then there's um, the Library Carpentry program, which is um, available from this website. And there's a little article about uh, it in one of our newsletters. And Library Carpentry is a um, program that you can either go to a workshop or you can just work through it on the website as well. And it's about uh, learning some more technical data skills um, in order to um, increase your skills in those areas, uh, specifically for librarians. So I just wanted to uh, thank my colleague, Martin Schweitzer. Uh, he gave um, two webinars recently about visualization um, from our from ANS, and uh, they, they are available from our presentations page, and that is as well where you can find these slides. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, stop talking. Uh, if there's any questions specifically for me, I'm happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, I'll hand over to Tom for his fun activity. Are there any questions? Does anybody have a question for Kate? Come on. Looks like we're handing over to Tom. Yeah, thank you, Kate. That was fabulous. No worries. No, thank you very much, everyone. No, and enjoy your time with Tom. Oh, so yes. Kate, we have a question. Yes. <laughs> Just quickly, are there any examples of Australian libraries or local libraries where you've seen this done well? I've got a good visualization samples. Um, I haven't. I wasn't able to find uh, anything um, specifically, but I would think that uh, these sort of things might be perhaps used in, if it was say used in reporting or something that's not publicly always publicly available. Um, so I I wasn't able to find uh, something. But if someone knows any good resources, please let me know and I can well, um, put up. Sorry. Apparently Ellen knows one. Yeah, um, Clark's Regional Library, who we were trying to get to talk today, but it conflicted with another meeting of them, so they'll be talking at another thing. They use data visualisation of their branch library statistics in their branch libraries. You can look at them online as well. Um, they're visualising membership usage data. It's a, an A4 um, display. They also have it for the library as a whole. It's actually really nice. That's Clark's Regional Library, and you can go under individual branches. Um, okay. A nice way of selling. I will, I will link to that from the um, ANS website as well, where, the, uh, where our presentation is. <coughs> Thank you for the example. Anyone else? No? Tom? Oh, we should thank I did. So I'll say thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> yes, no worries. Really good. Book. That was really, really good. Okay, and enjoy your time with Tom. Okay, so we're going to run a practical session now, um, and that means I'm going to get to move a little bit. Um, basically, we're going to have discussion groups while we're running this session, so I'm hoping that we can divide the room roughly into four. Um, I know it's early in the morning, <laughs> and it's too early to get moving, but uh, if you could please try to at least turn around and form a cluster. Let's say there's 80 of us here today, um, groups of 20. I don't mind if it's a little bit smaller and we have more groups. 
Yes, yeah. Um, uh, Okay, well, I'm happy to stand here. Okay. That's fine, but this one can go around. Yeah, um, I, can, I can be runner. Okay. Uh, and also, while you're in your groups, um, it might be worthwhile nominating a person to speak to the group, uh, uh, if you like. Um, there will be times where you can just yell out as well. Um, so my name's uh, Tom Honeyman. I'm the New South Wales Outreach Officer. So ANS is a, a national organisation, um, and I'm your point of contact if you have any questions for ANS. Um, so uh, feel free to email me or give me a call um, if you do have any questions following up from this. Um, what I'm hoping to do in this session today is we can't we can't all get out our laptops and do visualizations um, after that. Uh, so, but what we can do is we can take a visualization and we can pull it apart. And I'm hoping we can dig down into the data underneath and then maybe think about ways that we could build it up again into different stories from that same raw data. Um, and so the uh, graph that I've chosen today for us to look at is this one. Uh, just running on from the uh, weather-based theme of the, uh, of the previous presentation. Um, this is a visualisation taken from a blog article on The Economist uh, back in uh, October of 2017. I picked it today because it was also the subject of a, a data viz challenge um, on the Storytelling with Data blog. Um, and uh, the baseline data for this uh, was given out as, the, as part of the challenge and people were invited to submit alternate visualizations and critique the, the graph as well. Um, so this is one we're going to break down um, and then we'll try and piece it back together again. But so let's imagine that you get an inquiry from a student um, or just a general member of the public about this. They walk in with the article and they say, oh, I saw this graph and it just seems a little bit fishy to me. Um, what do you do? Um, well, today I want to look at this graph with a critical eye. Um, and also, while we're doing this, I want you to reflect on the constraints or possibilities in, um, in visualising, say, trends um, in the ECR data that I think you're going to be discussing a fair bit today. Uh, actually, as a quick aside, I'm a, I'm a linguist by training. Um, and seeing as we're talking about hurricanes, I'm kind of curious, and maybe I'm just going to exercise your arms. Uh, who in the room says hurricane? And we got. And who says hurricane? And okay. So yeah, that's right. All right. Very good, because we are in the southern hemisphere and we don't have hurricanes. So, uh, who in the room actually says hurricane? And who says hurricane? Okay, good. I feel good, because uh, I also say hurricane, but I got corrected uh, the other day. Uh, and the answer is that both are valid uh, pronunciations uh, in Australian English. Um, right. Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, also as a, an aside, uh, as a linguist by training, uh, I have a, a, a bunch of colleagues who work in that um, revitalization space for uh, Australian Indigenous languages. And let me say, that they would confirm just how important the uh, local library's role is in that space. Okay, so the first question that I'd like you to discuss uh, is, what is the takeaway story of this visualization? We saw in the previous presentation that uh, something should pop out as the story immediately um, from a graph. Um, if you could uh, just take a few uh, minutes to discuss what is the story, um, and uh, maybe even reflect on whether it's effective in expressing that story. And then the bonus question is, what is the larger context uh, in which that story um, is 
is expressed. So just a few minutes. Okay, so we should be narrowing in on one central story uh, at this point. There might be a few subplots uh, in this particular picture. Times up. Did any consensus view emerge from any group? Would anyone like to volunteer their group uh, to give us the story? Go for it. So we, we basically fell back onto the trend line. Yep. And we said the trend lines were but major hurricanes are gradually increasing. Yep. The trend for all hurricanes is going down, meaning there's less hurricanes. Exactly. So that is actually. So ultimately, there'll be one big hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You could actually, uh, you could, you could keep digging and you could keep going there. But yeah, the basically the takeaway story from this graph is supposed to be that uh, overall, graph uh, these hurricanes are becoming less frequent over time, um, but that perhaps major hurricanes are just ever so slightly increasing in frequency uh, over time. Do you think that, uh, so did, is that roughly what people landed on? Were there any other stories that kind of emerged from this data? There are more stories there. Um, there are other things that you could pull out. For instance, um, there's only been three category five uh, hurricanes um, in the entire time. Um, uh, another one might be um, that uh, if we look at the last block of time there, we have yet to experience any major hurricanes uh, in the 2011 to 2016 period. I, I don't think that's quite correct. 
I think it was 2005. I'm not a, uh, full disclosure here, I'm not a hurricane specialist um, or a hurricane specialist. Did anybody else pick up on anything else in, in the graph? Yes? Yes. Oh yes, I think we'll get into that in a minute, um, for sure. That's definitely a criticism of this graph. Um, so um, as to the question of uh, is it effective, um, we've got uh, a, at least a quarter of the room uh, uh, might agree. Um, is it effective? Um, did, it, did that story leap out to everyone straight away, or no? And I, I think that's I think that's actually a good point. Um, it maybe not that effective. Maybe that's why I picked it. Um, okay. And what is the larger context in which this story is being placed? I mean, if you're if you're going to put uh, this bit of information information there, what is the larger context in which this story is is taking place? What's the tension in this graph? Not quite, no. Uh, that would be, uh, I think you're blending it with uh, some of the previous graphs that we saw there. Um, in this particular case, the colours basically correspond to the category of the, the cyclone. Um, so red, the, the darkest red is for the, the category five cyclones and the blues, the lightest blue is for the category one uh, cyclone. So I would say that the larger context in which this, this controversial story is being pitched is, uh, is climate change. Um, and the idea is that maybe it runs counter to your expectations about what should be happening with cyclones. Um, and so that's the, that's the inherent tension in the story. Okay, so um, one of the principles uh, that I think we kind of skipped over rather quickly um, in the previous uh, presentation um, was clear labeling um, and only as much information as you need. There's a lot of information packed into this graph, um, a lot. Um, and that makes it inherently hard to visualise. Um, what I'd like you to do now, uh, just again a few more minutes, is just to basically pull out all of the components of information in this diagram. So for instance, um, the, uh, we have an x-axis along the bottom uh, that I, is showing the years in 10-year bands. Uh, that would be one component of the, uh, the graph. You could just break into your groups again um, and come up with a quick list. Uh, and I'll come back to you in a few more minutes, and then we will uh, talk about those things. Thank you. 
Okay, time's up. I think this time I'm quite happy to throw to the crowd. Um, uh, there are, by my accounting, there's uh, at least, uh, say, seven uh, items in here. Uh, does anyone want to offer up the first one? I've already given you the x axis. So, if that was the one you came up with, then. So the yes, that's right. The well, that would be the the aggregate or the the sum of of the the number of um, uh, cyclones in a given ten year band. That's right. Yep. The trend lines, excellent. Yes, that is definitely a major information component in this graph. Um, yes, excellent. And that is also a critical piece of information. That Thank you. That, that these are hurricanes that make landfall. So hurricanes basically go around a lot in the water um, and then when they really uh, uh, cause damage is when they make landfall. A room full of librarians and the critical one. The source. The source, thank you. Why did that not come up first? <laughs> and it breaks my heart as somebody interested in promoting uh, responsible citation of data uh, that that wasn't the first thing that left out at you. The source. The source is the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So that's a US agency, a uh, government agency that provides this data. Um, that would be the first place that I would be looking um, whenever I see a graph like this. There's the source and then there's the... It's it. Yes, thank you. The meta source. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, that is correct. So the economist is written down the bottom there, or if you like, my little uh, bit.ly link there actually takes you back to the, uh, the broader context in which this graph occurs. Two critical pieces of information. All right, we're starting to run out of things now, uh, and uh, they might not re you might not realize they're sources of information. Now, I would say that the, the, the title, um, uh, well, it's it's a good pun, um, and it's uh, it's clearly drawing both on the idea of um, that you're supposed to be thinking about this in terms of spin, um, for, in terms of climate change, uh, and also the spin cycle, the sort of swirling uh, hurricane. That I'd say that's a really good thing to draw on in, in visualization to activate those uh, synapses, um, and that subtitle as well, further giving information about. Um, uh, what the y-axis actually is relating. Uh, so that critical point about landfall. Um, and just the definition of what major hurricanes is uh, as well as the final thing. So we understand that there's a sort of meta bit of information there that if you take uh, categories three, four, and five, you um, end up with the major hurricanes. And by implication, then the blue ones are the minor hurricanes. So there's definitely a lot of information packed into this visualization, and it's quite a challenge uh, to show it all in one hit. 
so one of the things that you do to take a lot of data and um, compress it down so that um, it's easier to visualize is that you group numbers together. Um, there are a few groupings here. Um, and uh, I think this time around, I'm probably quite happy to take it from the crowd um, unless we get silence, in which case I will leave it um, for you to discuss for a little bit longer. But what groupings of numbers are shown in this visualization? I've already named one, um, that was the, the years. So the, you get the basically the aggregate over a 10 year period of all of the hurricanes that occur in a 10 year period. You don't get, for instance, how many hurricanes occur in a year. Hurricanes are a, a seasonal phenomenon, so it would be more useful to know it by year. Um, or you don't get it even further broken apart. You don't know what the hurricane date is, for instance. So ignoring the year altogether uh, and not grouping them by year. Um, we have it basically um, in a finer detail. So what other groups are there? Um, and what units of measurement are we using uh, in this graph? The categories are definitely a grouping. Um, that's exactly right. So um, the categories are basically the Sophia Simpson hurricane wind scale. Um, and how that's determined is um, it's a fairly simple um, way of dividing up things. Um, you basically take the sustained wind speed um, uh, as it reaches landfall, I think. Um, and if it falls within a particular band, then it's called a category blah, uh, category one through to five. Um, so for instance, uh, category one, uh, uh, between 74 inclusive, 74 and 95 miles per hour. Category three is 111 to 129. Uh, and category five is 157 miles per hour or greater. That's a, that's a category five uh, hurricane. Um, so, um, and those, those units of measure themselves are a little bit odd, um, let's just say. It's a rather simplistic way of, of, uh, of categorizing um, hurricanes. But the intention is that if it's, if it's a category three or above, then you're going to expect damage. Um, and then there are certain uh, projections about um, uh, loss of life, um, and the scale of the damage um, with those categories. Um, so it's important to understand the, the background of what's going on there um, because it does shape the way that the data is formed. So in the same way that grouping it by 10 years um, is going to shape the data, so does grouping things into categories. Uh, are there any other groupings? So that would be the 10-year the aggregate, yeah. Um, that is a grouping. There, the colours, thank you. There is actually a really obvious and iconic division in this. Uh, we have blue colours and we have red colours. Um, so hue is being used to differentiate minor and major uh, categories. And we're, you know, they, they're using a visual cue there to draw us into thinking uh, certain things about the data here. Um, the obvious association um, with red is maybe danger. Um, so these are the more critically, you know, uh, dangerous um, hurricanes. Well, the blue are your garden variety safe hurricanes, uh, basically. Um, so identifying these groupings and understanding the effect that they have on the data and our interpretation of the data is really critical to critiquing um, a graph. All right, here's an odd um, meta question. Um, just by looking at this graph, can we actually work out individual data points? Um, this is a tricky one, so I actually want you to um, uh, break back into your groups again and think about it. Um, just by looking at this graph, can we know individual data points? I'm <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, our time is up. Do we have any volunteers? So there's this uh, important sub-school of thought in uh, data visualization that says, well, as much as possible, data visualization should be iconic. So there should be a correspondence between what you see on the page and some original data point. Um, and so in the previous slide, we were talking about groupings of numbers, groupings, um, talking about averages, summing things together, and then not showing that in an iconic way is a way in which we step away from an iconic representation of the data. Um, there is really only one piece of information here that is iconic. Did anyone get it? So we can, all that we can recover from this graph um, from in that iconic uh, dimension is um, the count of <laughs> hurricanes in a 10 year band. That's it. That's the only piece of information that we can cover. However, there's, a, there's another possibility. Again, you're all librarians. How else can we recover the data? Go to the source. <laughs> it is all recoverable. Um, all of these numbers are actually recoverable uh, by going to the source. Um, so if you, again, had your student coming in here and saying, oh, I don't know, uh, I'm just a bit confused by this, or maybe, you know, how does this work in an Australian context? Well, go to the source. What data is lost or omitted uh, in this visualization? I'm going to give you a couple more minutes. You go for it. I was just saying the 10 year chunk. Yes. Yep. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So every time we group those numbers together, we lose information. Uh, another good principle in data visualization is only showing the data that's necessary. Um, can anyone point to some data that's, say, irrelevant in this graph? I agree, that's that's a very confusing component. Um, the first time I looked at this graph, I kind of assumed that it was actually five-year aggregates um, and that the band actually applied across uh, two bars um, because of the way they labeled it. And only when I was looking at it closer did I realize, oh, actually, they're 10-year they're bars and the labeling is awful. Um, 
That's definitely true. Exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't really add anything um, to the, the storytelling component. Now, this is this is something to, to reflect on constantly if you ever get around to making your own visualizations. It's it's hard to step away from the values of the data that you're very, very familiar with. But recognizing that some information is irrelevant and gets in the way of telling your story um, is really critical to making good visualizations. In this case, differentiation is between all hurricanes and major hurricanes. And to achieve that, we only need two colors. We don't need all five categories. So that is irrelevant information for the story being told, and it would definitely improve the graph. Thank you. Um, I'll just check, did anyone else notice uh, an irrelevant data point in here? It's a trick question, because we might get back to it and when we talk about what, what is misleading. Oh, that's going to stick in your minds now. <laughs> Perfect. So, is there anything that's misleading in this graph? Now, we've we've really unpacked it. We've looked at the what what data is being expressed, what data is being grouped together, um, and so I'm asking now, what is misleading, or what should you be skeptical about um, in this graph? A student turns up and says, "I think it's a bit fishy." What is fishy? Precisely. Um, now, I'm, I'm not going to dig into um, statistics in this talk, um, but the trend lines are tools that are designed to make you, uh, they're, they're the ultimate grouping, if you like. Um, you're basically saying, of all of this data, there's a very simple linear relationship, and we can see that it's tracking in one direction. Um, so a trend line is an inherently uh, misleading. It's, it's still a factual thing. It still represents something about the numbers that you're given, but it's an inherently potentially misleading thing um, within that graph. Um, and so a quick show of hands, um, now that we've hit this point, is this graph convincing in the story that it's telling us, or uh, are we now starting to wonder if there's something going on? Uh, so for those that still find it convincing, who think that um, major hurricanes are slightly increasing, minor hurricanes are, uh, sorry, all hurricanes are on the decline, is the story, does the still, does the story still hold for you? Maybe my leading question has kind of affected the, the, the outcome here. Um, so, yes, yes, that's also very misleading. Um, yeah, and certainly that's what your student might be thinking um, when they come in um, and ask, well, how do I go about working this out for Australia, or is this true in Australia? And you say, well, let's, let's work it out. Um, so, uh, then I'm going to take it that most of the crowd, seeing as nobody put their hand up, now thinks that maybe there's something fishy going on here. Yep. So when we talk about improving this, I want you to think about um, what alternate sources of information um, you could draw upon. Yes, absolutely. Um, that would be a powerful way in which you could improve the, um, the visualization is to draw it, it's to mark off historic events, um, to remind people of the scale um, of, of Category 5 events. Um, so there's one, um, uh, I, I think I heard somebody mentioning the, uh, the x-axis before um, and saying, well, why does it start at 1851? Um, I think that might be because uh, that's when we're basically talking about the same landmass um, uniformly uh, across the whole graph. Um, but the one critically misleading thing here 
is the um, uh, the final bar on the right. Um, that is actually irrelevant information um, uh, because it's incomplete. It's not a ten-year period. Um, it doesn't indicate that there um, that the future holds no major hurricanes. Um, it just means that in the time band that they've actually specified, there didn't happen to be any major hurricanes. You could create an alternate visualization where the take-home message was, we're due for about six major hurricanes in the remaining uh, two years of, <laughs> of this decade, um, if this prediction is correct. Right? That's a completely different story, um, uh, not very well highlighted in this visualization. Okay, so could this graph be better? Yes. <laughs> um, now I picked this because there are a few graphs, there are actually quite a few graphs. Uh, I've got a link at the end, um, you can go and have a look, um, that I wanted to show you. Now I think, although it's misleading, um, I don't think the original graph is incorrect. Um, I think that is, a, that is a proper representation of a linear regression of the data, that those trend lines are there. You could actually emphasize that by doing a graph that separated out category one, and two versus category three, four, and five uh, hurricanes, and repeat the same thing, and then the, the steepness of the lines would be greater. So if we sum those two together, the decline would be shallower. So you can pull that apart and make that more the story. Uh, you could definitely um, expose every single year. Um, so that's what this graph does. The x-axis is now showing the total number of hurricanes, uh, sorry, of, of storms altogether um, within a given year. We've lost that information about the category, and we're just curious to know, well, okay, are the storms actually decreasing over time? And instead of using a, a, a linear um, a trend line, we're now doing what's called a 10-year moving average. So this actually exposes some more of the variation. Uh, if there was a clear decline over time, then that uh, we would expect that the, the line would start higher on the left, and even though it wobbled, which should basically end up uh, lower on the right. I don't think that's clear from that 10-year average. Another thing we could do is instead of focusing on categories, we could take uh, a, a, a raw measure of those categories. So we could take the mean wind speed, which is what is used to determine the, um, the categories, and we could plot that instead. Unfortunately, this one, instead of um, showing you the mean wind speed uh, for a number of cyclones in a year, it basically takes the, the average of all of the cyclones in a given year um, and plots that instead. Okay. Does, Anyone spot any patterns in this graph? Yes, yeah. or um, a cycle. Yeah. So you're basically going up and down and up and down. And, and you know, lo and behold, weather patterns do that. Um, you have these uh, uh, El Nino, La Nina uh, cycles. Um, hmm. Sorry then. No. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So we've just rediscovered uh, weather systems. Um, fantastic. Um, I don't know, maybe on the right, that's certainly true for the left-hand side of the graph. Uh, on the right-hand side of the graph, well, maybe there's, you know, maybe we've lost the, the cyclic nature uh, of these particular storm systems. But I don't think a, a clear trend emerges um, from that, that data there. Here's a completely different visualization um, designed to tell another story again. Again, we're all working from the same raw data. Um, and this is a binning technique where you take, uh, you take 10 year periods and you basically put every hurricane in a box um, according to its category. And the size of the dot actually corresponds to the wind speed. So here's somebody who's tried to combine the wind speed and the category information together in the one visualization. And what leapt out to them was that perhaps um, 
if you ignore the distinction between uh, major and minor, well, actually, the major hurricanes are maybe getting a bit bigger, um, but less frequent over time as well. Whereas category three looks to be roughly, so we're going left to right, looks to be roughly the same over time. Uh, category two, yeah, about the same too. Uh, you know, nothing is particularly leaping out in this graph. And I think actually that's probably um, what is happening. All right, so I think I'm hoping that having pulled this apart, um, you can now go away and reflect on the data that you deal with yourself, um, that uh, you are composing a story when you do this, um, that you can lead people down the wrong path by uh, not labeling things correctly, or maybe focusing a little bit too deeply on the data. Um, but yes, I'm gonna leave it there, because I am out of time. <laughs> I will put the slides up on the ANS website too, which includes links to the, the data challenge um, and a lot more veg visualizations. Uh, and sadly, I didn't get to promote the Bureau of Meteorology there, but they have a great summary of the situation for cyclones. Tom, before you go, thank you very, very much. And thank that's you. all the perspective Cool. So thank you to Tom. And I just need to apologise to the online people because I completely forgot to screen share for Tom's presentation. So my apologies, you will need to check that on the ANS website. Okay, thank you Ellen. And thank you Tom and thank you Kate and thank you everybody for your participation in um, that little group activity there. It's always fun when you get to chat among yourselves and try and break down as we generally do every other day when we have someone walk on the door and say please explain this to us. Um, so that was really, really good. And I think the added bit there is that hurricanes have very little context for us in Australia, so it's always nice to get something that we have no familiarity with and take it apart. Okay. So I'm just going to talk briefly about what reference looks like in your library. This, I, I guess the genesis for this talk came about from a series of discussions, and it is in itself an ongoing discussion. Um, it, it comes from library staff questioning what reference is, what is the role of the reference librarian, what constitutes a healthy reference collection, how the face of information and reference services continues to change as library services evolve, as councils emerge, and as, it, as technologies emerge to challenge traditional methodologies and service models. And that one works. We'll go with that. Okay. Yep, that works. Okay. Like I said, as technologies evolve to challenge us on a daily basis. The talk's also been influenced by um, the Vala conference in Melbourne at the beginning of the year that I was quite lucky to attend. Um, VALA is an opportunity to explore outside the public library, to be exposed to some new and exciting ideas. And it's always good, in my opinion, to hear and see how other libraries are doing things. VALA can also be a source for speakers at other library events, like this seminar today. And the SWITCH conference in November. This year, SWITCH is in COPS. Plug. And you should all come, really, you should. 
So you can follow New South Wales PLA on Facebook and Twitter, and that seriously is my one single shameless plug for the day. I've also been inspired in putting this together today by the American Library Association's Libraries Transform campaign. Now this is aimed at supporting libraries in developing targeted campaigns to raise their profile within parent organisations and their communities. And as public libraries, we all know what it's like to live within the grander organisation of our councils. So it's not just our communities that we serve, it's our councils as well. Not only that, earlier in the year, in, indeed at the uh, Reader's Advisory Seminar, Duncan Smith from Novelist spoke about the future of Reader's Advisory and looking from transactions to embedded relationships. And he also provided some training sessions around the state following that seminar. And if you ever do get the chance to go back through and have a look at his presentation, there are some takeaways from an information and reference services point of view. Most importantly, I have been inspired this year by this particular book, Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism by Sophia Noble. And this is the book that John Valence uh, referenced earlier. Is a challenging, scathing, rewarding, interesting and invigorating read. It's one of those things where I'll basically say, if you take nothing away from today, take the title of this book, find it, <coughs> read it and be challenged. Go back, take a good hard look at how you do reference services at your library, how you catalogue and how you define your services and your collections. So when I took all these you know, various things together, it caused me to ask more closely of myself, what does reference look like in my library? What do I do to empower and engage? What do I do or don't do that disenfranchises and prohibits? This is my library. So when you walk in the door of my library, how do you know which way to turn? What helps you guide through this space? that I am familiar with, but you are not. Where can you find someone to ask? Do they look approachable or are there barriers in the way? And are you made to feel welcome? And I will acknowledge at this point that I took all of these photos, generally when there was no one in the library, so I didn't have to ask their permission to then display their images here today. So yeah, there's no one here, there's no one, in fact I think there's only one person behind the desk shelving something. But where are the barriers? Have I made it easy in my library for you to walk in the door and find what you're looking for or to ask me a question? What about when you visit my library online? Using your computer, using your tablet, or using your phone. Have any of you, in fact, used your library website recently on your phone? Show of hands. Who uses their library website on their phone? Who finds it easy to use their library website on their phone? I really need to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that, that is actually a point I get to later about this difference between, I suppose that might be the question I ask right now. Who has a library website separate to the council website? Who's your, is your library website separate to your council website? Is your library website software what makes it the same as your council website? Whose is different? Oh, you lucky, lucky people. I'm actually spending a lot of time uh, recently, mainly since uh, March, where I sat in an airport lounge and thought, ah, oh, you know what? 
I'll just use these hours while I'm waiting for my plane to fly back home and I'll go and download, you know, I'll stream a video. We've got Beamer film. Not a problem. Now, I can't get to it. Can't actually get to any of our databases. Damn it, that's actually my job. Someone stuffed up there, that would be me. I stuffed up. I can't get to my own library databases. Hence, since January, I've been spending an awful lot of time fixing that aspect so that I can find stuff. Now, part of this was that when we upgraded our, our library website, we did so with a bit of a rush. We were very time poor. Council IT was pushing us to get us off that server and onto the other server, and can we just dump the information across, whole new structure, using SharePoint. I hate SharePoint. And we lost a lot of stuff. And it's like this was the first time we could say with certainty that we had a mobile responsive website. Don't worry about designing it or any of the information from the mobile end. Just work it out on your computer. The mobile responsive bit will take care of itself. Obviously. In hindsight, um, no, I do it completely differently. Um, I'd, I'd go from the opposite angle up. I'd make sure that, yes, here's our basic structure, but how does it look like from my phone? And when I move up and try to navigate, is everything where it should be? Should I change some of my menu options that I can see on my phone for other ones? Have I really thought about that? And I'll admit, in all honesty, I didn't have the flash U-Butte phone I have now. I had a daggy old HTC that didn't really do a whole lot, so I didn't really care, because it didn't actually impact on me at the time. Because I wasn't thinking about my library customers. So this is the difference. This is my library homepage on my computer at work. And this is what it looks like on my phone. You can see my options are a touch limited. So, you know, it's really, you know, I, I knew that when we upgraded our, our library website that from, you know, even just on the website side of things, let alone the mobile phone side of things, that it, it did suck a bit. But um, it's something else entirely to experience just how sucky it is for yourself. And if this has not been a good experience for me, with all the knowledge that I bring to this website, I know its structure inside out. I know where stuff is. I could probably recite the site map. I know that. But if my mum was trying to navigate this site, could she do it? On her computer at home? Probably. I'd get a lot of phone calls, but she'd get through it. On her phone, not a chance. So I've just locked out the entire portion of the community from using my website. So what does reference look like in my library? When you use the OPAC, are my subject headings relevant and open? Do we have simple search terms or complicated jargon to describe library stock? Is every detail that's visible in bibliographic records obvious and useful? Or does it put people off? Are we making the most use of the capabilities and capacity of our LMS? What are other libraries doing with their OPAC and LMS that we could steal and implement for my library? So what are other libraries doing with their OPACs and LMS that you could steal and implement in your library? This is the delightful expanded visualisation, if you like, of the OPAC on my phone. The centrepiece is what comes up first. My two little left arrow and right arrow are what pops up when I touch on those. Again, it's on my, own, my phone and I only see the beginnings of what's available and the, the facets on the, the left and the right there. And I only get the first little delightful 
bucket list of new picture books. So is my OPAC useful and easy to navigate on my phone? Or do I in fact need a library degree to do this? Is the logic behind its design really obvious? And can you get to all the things or are they hidden or obscured? Now we have library websites and we have OPACs. So are things that are accessible on our website also accessible through our OPAC? Have you catalogued all your databases? Are they there? Who has catalogued all their databases? So you can find them in your OPAC. So I can find them on my phone. So what does reference look like in your library? Do you care? When you're in the library, want to access the library's virtual collections, is this easy to do? As we continue to make more and more of our collections available online, do we also make it easy for people to access and use these resources when they are physically in the library? Or do we take the approach of, you can access these from home and see that as the cure all, push them out the door and suggest they go and explore our online collections somewhere else? Or do we hold out a chair and say, here, let me help you get online and get started. Take your time. If all that so many of our members have is access to our public PCs, do we make it easy for them to also access our virtual collections and resources? Or do we limit their time? Do we disregard our subscription agreements? Do we think about any of this stuff when we decide who can use our public PCs and what they can access? Are we thinking about our members and visitors in terms of what we can enable or what we can restrict? And once people do get online, how easy is it for them to navigate to your digital collections? Or are they hidden under layers of jargon and library speak? And if you regularly use your sitemap to navigate to particular pages on your website because you find it hard yourself to find the page you're looking for, imagine how your library members feel. And that to me was the possibly the classic warning sign that my website wasn't doing what I needed it to do because I was using the sitemap all the time because I could find stuff there. It's really straightforward and easy. And when we had our library redesign done, and the suggestion that we remove the sitemap from the page was offered up by one of the IT people. I said, oh, no, 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 I need that there so I can find stuff. Did I think about our members, our community? Yeah, well, I did. At least I've got the sitemap there. And anyone who knows how a website works knows that if you go to the sitemap, you'll find something. That's what I tell myself anyway. So can you find these collections on your phone? I can now. Have you tried? Do you know where to look? What collections do you provide? In addition to, the, in addition to those available through the statewide and consortia databases, are these the best ones suited to your collection? Or are you just making do with what's there because they're free from the statewide consortium of databases. How do you share them on your website? Are they catalogued and accessible through your OPAC? Now, I know that if I want to get to our databases, that I click on get help with my homework. For my mother, who doesn't do homework anymore, if she wants to access my databases, how does she know to click on that one? It doesn't, because I haven't made it obvious as to that's where we find them. And we talk about databases and e-resources. Is this a relevant term? I spent a lot of time on my phone to my mother explaining how her local library works. She uses her local library a lot. So it's that, or oh, I send it to you guys up there because, you know, she's asking questions. How does this work? It's not obvious. How many of your members ask questions? How does this work? It's not obvious. 
No. Go back one. Uh, we'll do that one. In order to appreciate what preference looks like in your library, you need to question your website design, question your OPACs, question how search really works within your OPACs. If your OPAC provides predictive text, what is that prediction based on? You need to know how it works, and if it doesn't work how you think it should, then get it changed. Hassle your LMS provider until you end up with a product that is most useful to your library. Question how your LMS displays information about your collections. Question your library's practices and procedures. Question everything. Just because that's how you do it doesn't mean that's how it works for your community. So maybe it needs to change. Is this the best way? Is this the most efficient way? Is this what works for them rather than for us? Question your vendors. As libraries, we like to give our stuff away, but vendors sell their stuff and they have a vested interest in their product, which we libraries often ignore. We cannot do this. So, how are your information and reference collections displayed? How accessible are they? How findable are they? Yes, this is my reference collection at COPS. And the, the one on the right is the council information going into local studies, language material, and English workshop material. And that's how we sell it. Mind you, we do have a little sign that says local heritage, which is quite popular among people, and they, they quite like that one. But do your collections truly reflect your communities? Who are your members? Who are your visitors? Who are your users? Do you know? Or do you think you know? Who is our community? How do we provide the service they both need and deserve? What does reference look like in your library? So if you're sitting here today thinking, yeah, my library's pretty crap at this. And I ask you, what are you going to do about it? What are you doing about it? And I do appreciate, as I've asked earlier, that a number of libraries are restricted in what they can achieve for their website because it's part of a larger council one. Um, but have you thought about really talking, sitting down with, having a chat, sharing perspectives with the person in council who's responsible for the library part of the website and seeing what they can tweak if they know where you're coming from? Have you waved the library banner to say, yeah, we have needs for our website which are just as important as the rates section? Now, I mentioned this book earlier. Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism, really got me thinking about the Dewey Decimal System, which we use. Across the globe, we use it. It also got me thinking about the Library of Congress subject headings, their ongoing implementation and usage in public libraries, and for myself, who at no point classifies herself as a cataloger, I seem to spend an awful lot of time in my library's catalogue thinking and planning and plotting ways to improve the information we make available to our members. I am annoyed by Dewey on a regular basis. It's exclusive, racist, misogynistic and no longer relevant. And I'm sure I'm not alone in this opinion. I am concerned also with our alliance on LCSH without querying if the terms being used are relevant and useful for our Australian society. Local cataloguing rules are a fabulous thing which ought to be used more widely in Australian libraries and also shared with each other. Now I'm not saying that these fundamental library components are completely without use. I do however question their ongoing relevance in our Australian society and I remind you that they come from the historical viewpoint of the privileged white American male. Where is their allowance for the sheer global scope of their ethnicity, culture, religion, sexuality, geography, where the bulk of each decimal allocation is focused on Anglo-Saxon, Christian, America, with little or negligible consideration of any alternative. Yes, over the years, additions and changes have been made, 
but have we done enough? Libraries do like to organise things. We like to catalogue, like to know where to put things and where to find them. But in strictly following these guidelines, I question at what cost this is to our client base. How many of our members, how much of our community do we put offside or they even walk in the door because of the way we describe things within our collections using a controlled vocabulary that isn't ours. If libraries aim to be the collective memory of their communities, then the very language that our catalogues use should reflect those communities. These ones here in Australia. So are we being flexible enough in their implementation and usage in our catalogues? Do you catalogue for your members and visitors or for an outdated set of norms that reinforce a swathe of social, cultural and gender biases? If search is a source of reality, then what does it mean in practical terms to search for concepts about gender, ethnicity, culture, sexuality, only to find that information lacking, misrepresentative and biased in your OPAC? What does reference look like in your library? The conversation that comes from the idea of critical librarianship. When any one of us starts to really look into the way we present reference and information services and question the status quo, we are taking steps towards developing a library service that is truly responsive to the needs of our communities and truly reflective of those self same communities, which further embeds us within the value stream of our communities. Libraries are not neutral. So often we focus our library energies on our services, collections, in terms of things we can count, things we can do that we can count, things that we can buy that we can count loans, people in the door, things we count. But there is much more to providing information and reference services in our libraries than these alone. We are more than our programs. We are more than our collections. But it is up to us as New South Wales Public Library reference and information staff to argue for improved local cataloguing rules, for the implementation of localised LMS parameters, which include languages and subject headings and norms specific to the Australian experience. Libraries are not neutral, and while we continue to advocate for our communities, we can never be regarded as neutral. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Just in regards to uh, your third point about uh, the change in your website and the, you know, the bad change in your website, and about, I was going to say, do you, have you had, and this could be for anyone, any metrics around what success looks like? Like if it hits on the website, hits on the database, and then when you're sitting down, as you suggest, with the IT department, council, or things like that, bringing that to them and say, well, obviously we need something to happen because we had so many hits on the last one to a reduced hit rate. Now, so clearly there's a problem and that might be easier to start that conversation rather than just going in and saying it needs to be changed. We, um, we've run Google Analytics on both our library website and our library OPAC. And it's a good point because when we transitioned to the new version of the website, they forgot to move it. So we had something like three months of no data. And the fact that we could go with, so, and that provided in a way a nice clear period of going, <coughs> someone dropped the ball, oops as well as here's how we were travelling on our library website. Here's, people were hitting pages, usage, no data. New website, so not easy to use. 
usage, data, going down, start to improve things. Oh yeah, it's coming back. So yes, I cannot stress how important analytics on your website and in your OPAC are. They give you pieces of information that tell a story. Where people were, what they used. Um, for instance, we really we recently ran um, our gallery has still, which is a still life um, competition exhibition, and the entries were completely done online for the first time. And we could tell that most artists use a Mac. Most library folk don't. We can show it from the data. So yes. Anything else? Yes. Um, I probably don't need the mic. Um, I'm talking to people online. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I'm just curious. I've never really considered the concept of not having the Dewey or the Library of Congress subject headings, and I definitely have no catalogue experience myself. But the thing that um, occurs to me is that's the one point of similarity that you can go to any library. Um, and have that system, if you, um, you know, taught in it, then you can sort of go to any library anywhere. And um, what what would I totally understand the principle of what you're saying and agree with that? But then, without coming up with something that, so for example, if every local community had specific um, methodology methodology for dividing and um, cataloging things, then would that be a different problem where we would then have people coming into a library space and learning in every space how to... Um, and you only the community can access it. Yeah, I, I, I just feel like it's a, um, a, to the, a, a challenge to the entire world. Oh, it is a challenge to the entire world. world. And, and I guess so that's bad, the point. But I'm yeah. just, what would... What would Yes, those things, uniting principles. I don't know if you've ever gone and looked in uh, religion. You get a whole swathe and then other. How many people actually sit within other? Or, well, you know, majority of the world. Um, and, and that's, it's actually, um, yes, that is, and that's the, I guess, the thing about critical librarianship. It's having those discussions about this doesn't actually meet our global community's needs, let alone our Australian ones. Ellen. But also, if you read Algorithms of Oppression, <laughs> uh, this isn't a synchronised plug, by the way, but if you read it, she actually gives an example of um, a library that lobbied on behalf of its clients to Library of Congress to change subject headings. Library of Congress changed the subject headings. So there are a range of pathways you can go down because the subject headings were offensive. So the students raised it with the librarians, the librarians went, yeah, they are, aren't they? Oh, let's see what we can do about it. So there's a range of options to consider. There was, um, in fact, this morning, and of course now I can't find it, a, um, a tweet that came out that said that the word homosexuality had been removed from the list of criminal activity, oh, no, diseases. Homosexuality is no longer who, WHO is no longer defines homosexuality as a disease. That's what we need to keep pushing for, is making sure that how we describe how we interpret, how we present, actually reflects our global community as a whole, instead of something that has generated from single white Anglo-Saxon male America. Yes, good point, Ellen. Um, since we all got to, well, okay. Everyone over here got to stand up and stretch because we all stood up over there. But these other groups kind of stood stood down, sat down, <laughs> like in English. Um, so 
I would like you to take one moment to stand up in your seats, turn around slowly. I will count, you know, one, two, three, four, and then sit down again. Okay, you can sit down now. Sit down. And I would like to invite Catherine.